Um, okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to session R12, Roundtable 12, the importance of communication in STEM. Uh, today, uh, my name is Janae Gripper. Today I'll be your chair for this session. And we have three presentations that you see on the screen. Before I give the floor over to our presenters, there are two things that I would like to share. So first thing is that the session is being recorded. So if anyone chooses to not be recorded, they can always turn off their screen. You can always rename yourself as well by click clicking on the three dots in your image and changing your name by using the rename function. And the second thing is that we are using the closed captioning function. So uh, the text and subtitles that will be at the bottom of your screen, you can always hide them or show them again by going to more in your bottom panel to turn them, turn them off by clicking hide subtitles or to turn them on by clicking show subtitles. So now that we have those two things out of the way, I will turn it over to our presenters to get started. Should I start without any other un information from your part? Yes, go ahead. You can get started. You can introduce yourself. <laughs> okay. Um, so my name is Caroline Cormier, and I'm working with uh, Simon Langlois. Peut-être Simon, juste allumer ta caméra pour dire un petit bonjour. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm a, a chemistry teacher at Cégep André Lahando, and Simon is a physics teacher at uh, Marie Victorin. <clears throat> and we will be talking about our uh, th the last research we completed last year. Um, it was a Perea funded research about oral communication in science. So, um, Simon, si tu veux que j'avance les slides, ou est-ce que tu veux partager ton écran? Veux-tu avancer les slides? C'est bon. So, hi everybody, I'm glad to be here. There's some uh, construction going on in my uh, underground. Uh, basement, uh, the, where we got some trouble with the, the toilet, so sorry for that. It will, I asked them to, to stop for 15 minutes, so they will be doing that soon. Um, so uh, the, we've t today we'll talk to you about the, the lack of, communi uh, of, uh, of communication training and, and communication in general in science. Uh, what we do know from um, research in, in literature is that there's a gap uh, in the science program and in, in general. So there's a lack of training in that uh, field. And we do know that it is really important for uh, students to develop uh, oral communication skills from uh, a personal point of view for the civic life and also for the professional life. For in every uh, profession there is, uh, oral com communication skill is really important. So we've decided to look uh, at that uh, topic from the, the, the perspective of the students, so from the, their perception and their attitude towards uh, the oral communication. So we've adapted a framework from uh, Van Alderen, Smith, and Van der Molen, uh, which was used from, uh, for elementary teachers and uh, science teaching uh, from elementary teachers. And we adapted that model to oral communication in science. So that model is quite nice. It, it, it is composed of three dimensions. It's called the Parox model. Uh, three, three dimension: the cognitive belief towards oral communication, the affective states, and the perceived control. And those dimensions are, uh, under each dimension, there are components of attitude. So the first one is perceived relevance. Do they think it is really useful and for their personal and professional life? Uh, are they enjoying doing oral communication? Are they having anxiety or stress uh, doing so? And finally, the perceived control dimension is how can they think they can control the outcome of the, the, perf the, of the oral communication. So in that component, there's two, uh, in that dimension, there's two components, the self-efficacy and the context dependency. The self-efficacy is de decomposed in two aspects, uh, which are, are original from our research. So the because the self-efficacy normally refers is a, one construct, but we decompose it in two aspects. So the first one is, uh, is my presentation will be knowledgeable, uh, is the content will be understandable by the, the audience, and do I respect the code and the language uh, of the presentation ne needed? So that's the first component, which is really different from our point of view, from the showmanship self-efficacy, which, which is the, the ability to uh, have the attention of the audience and to, uh, to be dynamic, to, 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 to get the interest of the audience. 
And uh, finally, the context dependency emerged from our interviews. And uh, the context dependency uh, is more uh, the, the dependency on, on uh, materials, like uh, do I need slides to do the presentation? Do I need a partner? Do I need to have notes? Or can I do it? The, uh, and it, and it, whatever the context, I can do with the presentation. So all those uh, components of the attitude model leads to a behavior. The behavior is the performance, is where we can evaluate the student uh, in his oral presentation. So we were asking ourselves the link between the, the attitude of the students and the, the outcome behavior. Is there a link or is there, uh, is one of the components influence more the behavior at the end? So to do so, uh, we've developed three different uh, question, uh, that data collection. Well, one data collection and three uh, tools. The first one is the PAC questionnaire, uh, which is, uh, it measured the different components of the, the, mod, the model, uh, the framework. Uh, after that, you got the observation of our role presentation. So it's the behavior part. So we, we've been in different classes to observe the behavior of the, uh, the, of the students. And finally, to go deeper, we have some interviews with some of the students to understand the, more in, deep, in depth the, the link between those two. So for the PAX questionnaire, it was a four level Likert type 34 item questionnaire from one totally disagree to four totally agree. 2.5 is the, med the median of the, of the scale. So kind of a neutral position. Um, so it measures five of the components. As I told you earlier, the sixth one emerged in the qualitative data. So we did not measure it from uh, the context dependency from uh, the, the past questionnaire. And uh, we we have some participants from Science Student Pro Program, a seven francophone CEGEP. From we interviewed them. We we done uh, we passed the past questionnaire from semester one to sem and in semester four. We'll be focusing more on semester four students, the 100, 189 students, because some of them pass uh, the interviews, the past questionnaire, and uh, I've done some videotaping too uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the classroom. So, um, so for the past questionnaire, the first result that we can show you is the student, science student, and in the literature, it was really not clear. A lot of students did not perceive the relevance of our oral communication, but our students that we, the participant of our study, uh, show a score at 3.42. So it's really close to the four. So it, they, they, they perceive the relevance, the importance. Is it just me or I cannot hear Simon? It's not just you. No. Okay, you so, so, so go ahead. I will, I will go ahead and if he comes lot, back. But... Oh, sorry. Perfect. Uh, Simon, you just came back. <laughs> Simon, tu gèles un peu. Okay, I'll close my video. Is it better now? Oui. Okay. So, um, yeah, so they don't feel a lot of anxiety towards overall communication, but a little bit. And those, the self-efficacy component, there are two, as I told, told you earlier. The code and content self-efficacy is at 3.15, so that's quite high, but we have a science student at semester four. Uh, so it's kind of obvious that, that there will be, uh, this result will be a, a high. And the showmanship is a little bit, it's at 2.9, it's, it's uh, positive, but there's a significant difference between the code and content result and the showmanship self-efficacy. So they feel more comfortable with the code and content than with the showmanship aspect of oral communication. Um, and I will continue with the, the next part of the data collection. So as Simon told you about the, the, the questionnaire where we measure the, you know, the factors that were highlighted in yellow. And now I'm, I will be teaching, uh, talking about what, uh, it, uh, what showed during the oral presentations in class. So we observed <clears throat> final uh, semester students during their final science course in a, a course that is called Projet de fin d'étude, <clears throat> which is in three different disciplines, either bio, maths, uh, chemistry, or physics. The public was a bit different between uh, those three classes. Th they were really real oral presentation, right? Uh, in in a, a real course. 
in biomath, the, the public, and in chemistry, the, the public was quite large, but in physics, it was only between two other uh, students and the teacher. So it was a much smaller um, audience. The students were prepared differently for <clears throat> because it was part of the course. So the teacher prepared the, the, their students differently. In biomaths, they were um, they were given instructions, and they were uh, the students were the, the the rubric was explained to them with the, the rubric they were uh, assessed with. In chemistry, they did have a, a a time during class for the students to to practice their presentation and to have it peer reviewed. So the preparation was a bit. Mm, uh, different in, in chemistry, it was uh, heavier. And in physics, there was only time for preparation, but nothing else, no instruction per se. And you can see, we observed a few students in each of those settings. <clears throat> the rubric we, we devised to evaluate, to assess um, oral competency or all, oral was taken from a bit from other tools, but nothing was in the literature was developed in a way that we can use it as is. So we developed a new rubric that we call a AOX, and it's, uh, it has three category and nine uh, criteria, and it is a, um, a, a rubric, it's much larger than that. I'm just listing here the criteria, but all the criteria are separated in levels. It's a, it's a graded uh, rubric. So as you can see, we observed language proficiency, the content, because it was an oral presentation in science, and the showmanship. So it goes along the self-efficacy components that uh, Simon discussed before. So the language proficiency refers to the code and the content, it's the content and the showmanship is called the same. As we can see here with the overall um, measure with that rubric is, well, students were quite good with all of those criteria, but as Simon said before, there were final uh, semester students in their last course, and they were only the volunteers who were observed during their presentation. So probably they expected to be good. But as you can see, the showmanship, the, the self-efficacy component of the showmanship was a bit lower and actually it was observed as being lower as well by the the um, the researchers who observed them so back to the research question all are those components of the the framework influence the behavior so the the oral presentation act, uh, as is and in fact only enjoyment and showmanship did have a positive correlation between the measurement of the PECAS and the uh, observation of the performance in the class. So that's quite interesting and it can point towards a, a couple of conclusions. So the correlations are important, but the lack of correlations are also important. So for example, between oral performance and perceived relevance, all students found that oral communication in class, in science, in the CIGEP, is very, very important regardless of their skills. So even if they were really bad <laughs> at doing oral presentation, they still felt it was really important for them. The oral, present the oral performance and anxiety and enjoyment, those who are stressed in oral presentation did not perform worse. A sane amount of anxiety before doing a presentation, that's, that's good, right? You don't want the students to be sloppy or something. So it doesn't impact it, their performance. But those who liked our presentation actually performed better. Probably what is before, you know, uh, in French we say, qu'est-ce qui vient en premier, l'œuf ou la poule? So is it because they liked it better, that they, pre they, they were better because they, in, they were involved in more oral practice maybe outside of school, probably, maybe. And the oral performance and self-efficacy, as we can see, the, the, the high self-efficacy showmanship students actually did perform better. So when they have a better, um, if they are more confident in themselves, they actually give a better presentation, but not only the showmanship part of the presentation, also 
the content part of the, the, the presentation and the language skills. So that's really inter interesting. But the code and content SC did not correlate with the performance. We highlighted two pedagogical implications for our uh, teacher colleagues. The, so not only stress reducing strategies must be planned, as we can see, it doesn't impact performance that much, but also ways of making oral presentation more enjoyable to students. Since liking the activity seems strongly to correlate with the performance. <clears throat> Maybe it's not exactly that way, the correlation, you know, it's not causation, but still, if it's more enjoyable, maybe students would involve more, they, they might engage more in oral uh, uh, communication, and maybe it will foster better uh, performance in the future. And the last thing, the higher, per, the higher showmanship, uh, uh, self-efficacy, showed better performance as well, so maybe, and I, I mentioned it before, maybe there is a potential underlying factor, which is confidence in presentation skills. So maybe we can, as teachers, maybe we can design activities that can foster the development of that part of self-efficacy, having students feel more comfort, for, comfortable in having good skills, you know, having the audience in, um, interested in the, in the presentation. So thank you. Thank you, Carolyn and Simon. Um, we next have Petra and Mary. Yeah, so once Carolyn, yeah, so now I can share my screen here. <clears throat> Does everybody see the screen correctly? Yes. Yeah, so good. Okay, well, I'm Petra. I teach chemistry uh, in Gaspé and uh, helping me with this presentation today will also be Murray from John Abbott College. Uh, our talk today is about Eau Claire, our online collaborative lab reporting environment. And as you can see, it's a joint project between Gaspé and John Abbott College. Our talk today will be divided as follows. I'll begin with a brief introduction and look at the pedagogy behind Eau Claire and then take you on a quick tour. And Murray will finish uh, by looking at some student survey results, as well as some student comments. So what exactly are we asking students to do when we're asking them to write a lab report? Well, from among the following, and I won't read the whole list, we're asking them to understand the research question, organize data, calculate values, create tables and graphs, maybe draw figures, write objectives, introduction, observations, discussion, conclusions, abstract, the least of which critically analyze the results and answer the research question. And we're asking them to do all of this in 40 to 54 minutes per lab, according to this back of the envelope calculation. So I don't know about you, but for me, my students were taking much longer to complete a lab report. So uh, to respect the student ponderation, I and possibly we have to trim down our reports. And as for the demands placed on the students, we're also asking them to manage different sources of information, often print and online. Uh, to use ever software effectively like Word and Excel, most of the time with little assistance. So we think that this is just a bit demanding and probably one of the reasons why we're getting reports that look pretty but that are empty in terms of the content and the analysis of the experimental results. So we developed Eau Claire, an online lab report platform that scaffolds lab report writing to produce, voila, a publication style report like this. So in a nutshell, Eau Claire helps the students not only produce this beautifully looking report, but also helps them to complete a report that shows a deeper understanding of the phenomena they're studying. In other words, a report that shows uh, some critical judgment, that some thought has gone into the analysis of the results. And it does so uh, in several ways. It scaffolds lab report writing in several ways. First of all, by providing partially pre-written report sections. So for example, maybe a student is asked to write a conclusion using their data and information provided in a pre-written introduction. So by pre-written, we mean that the teacher has written the introduction. So even though the student is not writing the complete report, they gain an understanding of the different sections of the report and the role of each section through this interaction. Eau Claire also scaffolds lab report writing 
by the automatic generation of tables and graphs. So tables and graphs may be generated automatically or not. Uh, it depends on uh, the skills you and competencies you would like to assess. And we don't necessarily have to assess all competencies and every skill with every lab report. So a benefit of automatic generation of tables and graphs is a greater focus on data interpretation. So instead of a question being like, how do we add a trend line? The question now becomes, well, what does this trend line mean? What does it say about the data? Okay. Eau Claire automatically generates a properly formatted report, as we have already seen, that looks like a published journal article. And the report includes sections that the student completed, as well as sections pre-written by the teacher. And the report meets the norms and practices of the scientific and engineering communities in terms of the typeset, like font, font size, spacing, in terms of the organization of the sections and subsections, and in terms of table and graph design. So graphs may be uh, uh, done automatically using the statistical package R and ggplot. And finally, Eau Claire facilitates collaboration in several ways. First of all, because it's multidisciplinary, so reports may be completed in chemistry and physics. Data may be shared uh, within and between lab groups. And reports may be done individually or in groups, so students in groups can log into the same report and work on it together at the same time. And not only can students collaborate, but also teachers through the sharing of lab templates and activities. And the added benefit of this is to harmonize programs of study across institutions. So basically then the overall goal of Eau Claire is to reduce the cognitive load on the student by taking the trivial aspects of lab report writing out of the equation and having the students focus on analyzing and critically evaluating their data. So now we'll go on a quick tour of the platform. Before I do so, I just would like to give you an idea about the status of Eau Claire. So Eau Claire accounts have been created for seven different CEGEPs and one university. You see the list there on the, on the slide. 11 professors have used Eau Claire to have their students uh, complete reports. And these teachers have created over 50 experiments in chemistry and physics, so combined chemistry and physics. And approximately over 500 students have used Eau Claire to complete lab reports. So they have been our guinea pigs. Before going on to uh, take the tour, I'd just like to thank everybody. I know Yann and Carmen have used it. I'm not sure about you, Caroline, but just like to thank you for your patience because there are still bugs with the system, uh, the platform, it is in development, and also to thank you for your interest. Okay, so our tour begins with our homepage. Uh, images of both colleges are on both sides. We have a little description of Eau Claire. There's a place at the top right to log in our sign out and a place at the bottom right, uh, there are icons, the question mark is a user manual, the bug is a bug report, and you can also uh, send us an email. The next slide here shows the teacher interface. It's the teacher interface because the menu bar is blue. Uh, the top menu here shows theory, procedure, pre-lab data analysis report, and new this year, evaluation, bibliography, and classroom. And this menu bar remains mostly the same for the student and the teacher interface. A teacher may choose to include all of these sections in the report or just some of them, so it's very customizable. Here, the teacher is working under the data section and creating a table with student input fields that are in red uh, for data related to the amount of iron in the sample. Once the teacher has completed this table, this is what the student sees on the student interface. So this, in the student interface, the menu bar is primarily MOVE uh, and students is actually on top of teacher in the top left. This table has green and red fields. So initially student input fields are red, which means students have to enter data or text. And once they've done so, they become green. At the bottom and about the middle of the screen, you'll see a warning value should be less than one. And in this case, the teacher has programmed a range of values to be accepted for the absorbance of the sample. And so when a student enters a value out of this range, a warning is displayed. So this is what we call our data validation in real time or our real time feedback. 
In the next uh, image here, we also see once again the teacher interface. Here, the teacher is programming a computed field, is in fact uh, programming uh, the mean value to be calculated using the computed field properties window. And this is what we see on the student interface uh, in the same table. So the student just has to complete, uh, click on the compute button in the bottom right, it's the green button, to get the average of the absorbance values. After completing all the sections, the student clicks on report and this uh, report is generated. So this LaTeX output is generated that shows all the sections of the report. So those pre-written by the teacher, as well as those completed by the student. In this case, the introduction was pre-written by the teacher and using the information in the introduction, the students had to answer a discussion question, write the conclusions and also write an abstract. The graph here at the top of the slide or the screen was automatically generated using the statistical package R and ggplot, which I've already mentioned, uh, and using the data in one of the tables. The report format was completely handled by Eau Claire. And to submit, the student just has to um, either print it and submit it a paper copy or can submit it as a PDF electronically. Uh, new this year is our collaborative evaluation feature. This was created to promote situated learning through interdisciplinary lab report assignments. So these assignments um, are created to teach and assess competencies in both science and language courses. So for example, a single lab report can be submitted through Eau Claire and be evaluated by a science and an English or a language teacher. This is uh, how it looks on the student on the teacher interface, and this is how it looks here on the student interface. So the student sees the evaluation grid, the value of each item, the mark, as well as comments from both teachers. And finally, also new this year, we have an image gallery, which is kind of a cool little uh, new feature for teachers and students, which basically holds images so teachers and students can reuse them uh, in, in the report. And so that takes me to the end. And now Murray will uh, continue on with some student survey results, as well as uh, some student comments. Yeah, thank you, Petra. That was excellent. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, how students felt about using this particular um, software uh, platform. Um, we did survey about, well, many of the students over a course of three years, um, you know, 18, 19, and 21. Of course, 2020 will go down in infamy as a lost year. Uh, so it's lost. <laughs> we didn't survey our students. So just wanted to say, how, how did they feel about it? Now, this is a perception attitudinal survey. Um, so it's very difficult to measure um, against an, you know, I'm an, an objective uh, value. Uh, so it's just their feeling. Did they like it or not? And overwhelmingly over the three years, even when it was, you know, and, and during these time, these four years, it was became more and more developed as a platform with more features. Um, overwhelmingly anywhere from, you know, 70 to 90% of the time, and, and that's percentage on the y-axis, sorry, we didn't put that in, it's percent. Um, most of the students, a vast majority of students really like this idea of writing, of using Eau Claire for this kind of uh, formal report. Um, of course, there's always some that, um, that don't. Um, and the, the results year after year are pretty consistent. I know there's some little differences, but they're pretty consistent. Um, advance the slide, Petra. Yeah. Petra has control of the screen. Mm -hmm. um, we did ask quite a long survey, uh, probably not quite as long as Carolyn's, but quite a long survey. And this one sort of combines all their sort of feelings um, or some attitudes for three different questions. One was the motivation to do well. And again, this is their own personal opinion were they more motivated in this kind of platform to do well? 
And again, um, many students, most students did feel um, they agreed with that. Yeah, they did, it did motivate them. In terms of retention, how did they think about the course content? How did they feel? Did they feel they uh, retained more of the course content by answering these kinds of questions? By maybe, um, you know, the questions do get a bit more um, deeper understanding or probe deeper understanding. They agreed with that statement. Now you'd see some big yellow bars on the, on the right. But what we did for the understanding of course content, it's not really disagree. They're disagreeing with the negative. So we asked a reverse question. Did they not, did not increase their understanding of course content? And they disagreed with that statement. So they really did think that they understood the course content better by using Eau Claire. Um, so all of these measures are, are, are good, play in favor of Eau Claire. And so we, this is really gives us a lot of, um, of uh, feedback to move forward. Okay, advance, please. Trying. Trying. Okay, now we'll do the good comments first. <laughs> um, so what are the good comments? They like the idea that it gathered all the information, it's stored it in a database, it's all backed up, they have access to this database from any web-based browser, whether they're home or at school or a friend's house, that data is already automatically saved as soon as you saw that green box. They like the idea they didn't have to worry about the court, the format of the report, um, and they really like that professional look of the report as it came out. And of course, they can always go back and forth and change things. They like the the, the uh, that idea. Now with Eau Claire, there's also the ability to share class data. So students can enter their own data and they could see the class data in real time. So they see if they're entering data that's way different than everyone else's data, they say, oh, well, they self-correct. They say, okay, what did I do wrong? So that was also part of it. Plus we could also probe and we did through questions why they think their data did not um, match um, the class data, what, what accounted for the deviations, et cetera. You can probe the data a, a lot more because this data is live. Um, live. Um, okay, you can go, yeah. What did they like least? Of course, there's always some people are not gonna like it. Some people prefer handwriting over typing. Uh, I don't know anyone like that, but, but I guess there are people like that. Um, now, math equations and chemical equations were a challenge. There, we did build in a math um, and chemical equation editor, uh, but it does take time. You know if you're typing equations, it's gonna take a while. Uh, so much easier and faster to do it by hand. It did take longer than anticipated to do the reports, and that's because we kind of ask questions that are not superficial. And so they had to reflect on the data. So I think it did take longer, and we have to be um, conscious of that fact. Uh, some people didn't like switching tabs, going between pages. Some people didn't like the fill-in-the-blank approach or the format. They preferred to put their own format together. Um, advance, how would you describe the Eau Claire platform to your professor or friends? Well, in general, they liked it. It was very different. It's very efficient. They like that the reports came out as very high quality. It was very simple. And of course, up to the teacher to decide how the format and the complexity of the report. And sometimes I, we have to admit, we probably did get carried away because there's so much you can do with this particular tool. One thing students appreciated where it was paperless. So especially now uh, in this pandemic, when we're not in school and we're all online, all my lab reports got submitted as PDFs online. I use Moodle, so that was fine. And Moodle has a built-in annotator. I, cr I graded it online. I returned it through Moodle online. It was all plus feedback, plus rubrics, and it just it was really, I never had to touch a piece of paper. I never had to spray bleach on it. Um, and because you can build in tables and Excel, you know, kind of an Excel type thing or graphical uh, things, uh, and you could, you know, put in computed fields, you don't have to switch between software, which was what uh, Petra had mentioned about reducing the cognitive load. So the idea that they have to use many different tools to do the same thing. 
So I'd just like to acknowledge our lead programmer, uh, Eric Waldman, who really put this all together um, in terms of all the coding. Uh, Susan Van Lith, who was at, uh, at the Gaspé, who did the logo and the site design. We had a number, and it was very important for us to involve um, computer science um, stagiaires who over the past four years contributed in some small way and some bigger ways to this work. And of course, we'd like to acknowledge Canada, Entente Canada, Quebec for funding a lot of this work and our respective Seychefs, Seychef to the Gaspé Z and the Zil and John Abbott for supporting this. And last thing is just uh, a, a reference to um, that some of the logos and symbols we use came from a um, Creative Commons um, site where we were able to use those things. And that's it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Petra and Mary. Next we have Yen and Carmen. Perfect. So just wanna make sure that the, you all see my screen. Does everybody see it full screen? Perfect. So what we'd like to talk to you about today was uh, safe, convenient, and hands-on at-home chemistry experiments. I don't know if you saw in recent news, but a university bookstore worker stole $20,000 worth of textbooks. And one savvy professor replied, oh man, I hope they recovered both those books. As you've seen, science material has been quite expensive for some students. And the goal of this presentation right now is just to show you a bunch of free stuff that we've developed. So just to give you a, a little background, we're both uh, professors at Boston College and Boston College Chemistry Department has 27 professors. There's 1,200 chemistry students in the fall semester and 1,000 chemistry students in the winter semester. Our semesters are 15 weeks long and the labs are um, usually two, week, two hours a week or three hours a week for organic chemistry. All of our labs fit a maximum of 22 students. So before the pandemic, we actually created a three series of pre-lab videos uh, tackling general chemistry, chemistry solutions, and organic chemistry. All these videos are freely accessible on the Dawson College Chemistry YouTube channel. But although videos are nice, substitute for labs, we thought that uh, with social distancing and homeschooling, our students still needed hands-on experience. It was important for us that our students were able to um, read a protocol assemble material, carry out an experiment, and interpret their own results. So for that reason, we created the CLAW. The CLAW stands for Chemistry Laboratory Alternative Workload. It was a funny name at first, but now we're stuck with it. So overall, we design at-home, hands-on chemistry experiments. And there's eight of them that we've designed that are freely accessible on the Salty's website. The first five that you see here tackle more chemistry of solution, while the last three tackle more organic chemistry. So typically, each protocol includes your, your typical objectives, introduction, material, procedure, and a few photos showing uh, the important steps of these uh, lab at home procedures. There's also help for students to perform calculations and analyze the data. There is a readily printable data sheet there that students can use, and there's, of course, a couple of troubleshooting suggestions. Every lab also has an optional activity that pretty much deals with one of the reagents that we use for this experiment. So where can you get these experiments or these protocols, I should say? Well, you can get them on the Salties website. You can go on resources and do active learning activities, click in on chemistry link and stuff like this, or much easier, just go on a search toolbar and type in the claw. You don't need to make the sound effect when you do. So the experiments that we designed were meant to be at the college level. Um, so here uh, is an example where students could determine the kinetics for a simple reaction involving a uh, blue food dye and bleach. Uh, so I just wanna take this moment now to thank our colleagues at John Abbott because this is an experiment that they actually do in person uh, in their um, chemistry course. And so we used this experiment and we adapted it to our at home experiment. Uh, so um, these are the these are the materials that were needed for the uh, for the experiment and um, some of the considerations uh, that we had to be that we took into that that we took when we were designing and implementing our experiments. Uh, the first one is that all the materials had to be accessible. Um, 
so at, at the time, right, there were the, of the disinfecting agents uh, were in a short supply at the start of the pandemic. So we had to make sure the students were able to get um, uh, materials that uh, were available um, and at grocery stores or pharmacies or at the dollar store. Um, and then there was uh, the measuring tools. You know, we could have uh, loaned out um, syringes or graduated cylinders, but we opted for things that they could use in our house. So measuring cups and measuring spoons. Uh, then there's the thermometer. Uh, the students could either purchase one or we, we um, you know, we could loan out the thermometers to our students. The deciding factor here was actually, uh, you know, how many students were uh, going to require the thermometer. So for our summer course, because it was only 40 students or less, um, we opted to prepare lab kits and uh, loan the thermometers out to the students. But this semester, this, uh, this past semester, we had over 600 students in our chemistry solutions course and they all needed a thermometer. So we um, asked them to purchase one. Um, we had them available at the bookstore, but you know, they, they could purchase one off um, online on Amazon. Uh, and, um, and so then that saved us from having to store 600 thermometers at the, at the end of the semester in our stock room, right? So the nice thing about that, having students purchase the thermometer, essentially they could, they could access everything else on their own. So we didn't have to provide uh, a lab kit. So that provided a lot of flexibility. Um, and then there was the smartphone. Uh, the cell phone. We anticipated that some students might not have had one, uh, but in the end, everyone did. Um, if there were problems, uh, we would have suggested the students just pair up and work together uh, virtually uh, on the experiment. Um, so the experiment itself, the procedure was quite simple. They just had to download an app that was free um, and then also purchase um, bleach that had the active ingredient uh, specified um, on the label and then set up a reaction glass on red construction paper. The, um, the app that we uh, used is actually a color reader. Um, and so it provided an RGB reading and those stand that sounds for red, green, and blue. And what the students needed was just the, um, the red value, um, which is coming off of the construction paper through the uh, reaction glass. And what, um, what we found cool was that, you know, the students were actually using their cell phone for, for science, right? Uh, now the, uh, the actual procedure, procedure just involved mixing water with some bleach, adding a drop of the blue food dye, and then monitoring the color, the amount of red coming through the solution, um, and recording the red value every 30 seconds. Um, you can see in the setup that the students just had to put their cell phone on a taller glass and have the camera pointing towards the solution, um, and then they just, they just left it and recorded their data. Uh, the experiment was, um, could be repeated by changing the amount of bleach um, and also changing the temperature in order to study the, the kinetics of this um, very simple reaction. Um, and then the data that they got, um, the red values allowed them to, to do like a practical analysis uh, and then allowed them to determine the rate law um, and the rate constant for, for, the, for the reaction. And it actually did complement what they were seeing uh, in, uh, in terms of the theory in the classroom. Um, now, sometimes the data didn't always, um, it wasn't always so straightforward, uh, but you know, for the most part, the students had good data or good enough data for them to, to work with. So some of these experiments are quantitative and some of these experiments were qualitative. So Carmen just showed an experiment that was quantitative. Here's an experiment that's more qualitative in a way that it's for an introduction to solubility. So the goal of this hands-on experience is just to determine uh, conditions and properties that are favoring solubility behavior. So for example, the material that they would be using are all commonly uh, found household materials or the stuff that you could find at your grocery store. The idea of this type is just to get them an introduction of solubility. So in the first part, you'd be mixing a bunch of liquids. So you'd be mixing together water with rubbing alcohol or baby oil or nail polish remover and see the effect of solubility. Uh, in the second part, we'd be using the same liquids, but this time we try to dissolve a solid in them, such as salt, sugar, or Vaseline. Now the third part, we're asking a student to test the solubility of packing peanuts. Now, I know that uh, during this uh, COVID time, lots of people have been ordering lots of stuff online, and that comes with 
repacking peanuts. These uh, peanuts are not good to eat, but uh, there are two different forms for them. Uh, a couple of years back, the peanuts were mostly made out of styrofoam, but nowadays these uh, packing peanuts are made out of cornstarch. So the solubility of these two packing peanuts are completely different, although their shape looks the same. And finally, in the, in the fourth part, um, we're asking students to uh, look at the solubility behavior uh, dependent on temperature. So we're asking them to dissolve salt in three different temperatures. There's no need for a thermometer in the way that the temperature that they're using is just ice cold water, room temperature water, and finally boiling water. We're asking our students to take a selfie after each part of these experiments. That way uh, we can assess that they're actually the ones doing these experiments. And students were actually pretty happy taking these selfies. These selfies are for, uh, are, are for the lab report. They're not to be shown to the entire class. It's just between the teacher and, uh, and them, or for a conference if they give me the rights and they did, so it's okay. But it was also nice to see our students during this time without a mask and smiling and performing some chemistry. So we asked for um, feedback uh, from our students based on the Likert scale. It was actually a five point scale, but I've just kind of combined uh, some of those responses to make it a little easier to read. Um, and uh, just like the, the, the survey that was conducted by the Eau Claire team, you know, our survey also was just based on perception, you know, how, how the students felt. Um, so we, the results here are based on four um, statements split into the two courses, uh, chemistry solution and organic chemistry one. Um, and so we asked for their opinion on whether uh, the instructions in the lab document were clear and easy to follow. Uh, the experiment could be performed in the standard lab period. So that's a two hour, like once they, once they acquired all of their materials, how long did it actually take for them to do the experiment at home? Um, did the experiment actually help them to better understand the theory seen in class? And the last one was, did they find the experiment interesting? Um, and so you can see here that the general response was very favorable um, with you know, the blue um, bars representing you know, students agreeing or strongly agreeing with the, those um, four statements. Uh, so now, you know, we remember that when we, ha when we had to transition online and, and adapt our lab components uh, when, the when the pandemic hit, you know, one of the main alternatives uh, to, um, to the lab component was ask students to watch videos of experiments that, you know, they would have done if they were in the lab or to carry out a simulation um, that was online. Uh, so in this, um, in this part of the survey, we wanted to ask the students, you know, uh, did they prefer the at-home experiments over the alternative of watching a video and then using data from the teacher to prepare the lab reports? So go ahead, Dan. Uh, and so here you can see that, again, the response was quite favorable. You know, the students uh, did have a preference um, or a non-preference uh, for doing these at-home experiments. Um, and we also got some really nice uh, comments from, um, from, from some of the students. Uh, thought we'd share a few with you guys. Um, you know, the, 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 structure, the comment here was that, you know, that, that the, the lab procedures were nice and clear um, and they thought that it was a fair task to ask students to, um, to do these experiments home. Uh, some students found the experiments actually really fun and they did say that they preferred it again over uh, the, any sort of um, online uh, simulation or watching a video. But then, of course, there were some, um, you know, not so, uh, not so positive responses. You know, some students were frustrated because they didn't get the um, data that they were hoping for, uh, or they had to repeat the experiments um, a few times before they could get something that made sense to them. So the lessons that we um, learned from um, this past year um, is that, you know, we wanted to uh, encourage students to break away from the screen and observe uh, a topic from the course uh, through a hands-on demonstration. Um, but, you know, it's important to set everyone's expectations. You know, that includes the teachers, our colleagues, um, and students that these experiments cannot, right, replace the precision that's seen with the in-person labs. Um, and that's due to the limitations and the variability uh, in the um, experiment or the equipment and the, and the conditions uh, in their home. So um, it's also important to let the students know that it's okay if they don't have, you know, superb um, results. Uh, that's totally expected. Um, 
you know, because this is this experiment is being done at home, it is easy for students to falsify their data. Uh, so uh, um, our experience is that, you know, um, it's best not for teachers not to grade their actual results, right, and put more emphasis on, um, you know, the the purpose of the experiment, you know, doing, carrying out, being able to follow a procedure um, and preparing a lab report and writing out a nice discussion based on the results that they got and their experience. Um, and then uh, alternatively, you know, teachers could also provide a set of data um, to give to students if they are having troubles. I also found that it helps to kind of do a demonstration of the experiments in my own kitchen, you know, kind of do like a little cooking demo uh, to give them an idea of um, what the experiment will uh, look like and give them some tips uh, for the procedure. And, and uh, I think Murray mentioned it before he had to leave, but um, some of the CLAW experiments have been um, added to the Eau Claire uh, system. And uh, so, you know, students get to, to prepare a lab report, just like uh, Petra introduced to us that, you know, they get to prepare, prepare a, very, a really nice scientific journal format. Oh, Murray's still here, okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and he actually implemented the spectrophotometry uh, Gatorade experiment with his students. Um, and so he had quite nice uh, feedback um, for, this, uh, for this particular experiment. So, um, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, sorry, yeah. Uh, so just to finish off, um, is that, you know, these experiments were uh, put together um, in a very short period of time and we shared them with the Salties community last summer. So it's been a year uh, and we really welcome um, feedback from anyone who's used them because uh, these, uh, these experiments are a work in progress and we are open to improving and um, updating them. Yeah, we never anticipated or said that these experiments were perfect. We're really uh, looking forward for any comments or constructive comments that anybody has to send our way. And also we invite other Celsius members if they design experiments that look like this to also publish them on the, the Celsius website. So <clears throat> overall, we think it's a great way to get students to manipulate household items in a meaningful manner. Um, also for remote colleges and stuff like this, there, you can do them as lab kits and you can provide your students with a bunch of stuff, but you could also use them not as lab kits, where it's just an instruction of material to gather for your students outside. So overall, these protocols can still be used post-pandemic as makeup experiments or for student projects. I'd like to, uh, we'd like to acknowledge uh, everybody at Salties that made this super conference possible, uh, Dawson College, Chemistry Department, our lab technicians, and you for your attention. If you have any questions, don't be shy to reach out to Carmen and I, or simply send an email to Salties. They'll forward it to us. And if you have any questions, I guess there will be a question period that you can ask us any. Exactly. Thank you, Carmen and Jan. Yes, the, there will be a question period, and that is now. So if you have any questions or feedback, uh, you can definitely give that to any of our presenters. I just want to say, though, uh, Jan and Carmen, that I'm, so I'm, I'm from Satis. I'm a research assistant with Satis, for those who don't know. Um, and I was hoping to put their material onto the website. And just reading through those and, like, doing that, you know, as a research, research assistant, I was really impressed and I thought it was really cool. And I know a student who in Sija last, last uh, spring who had to do the Gatorade, I think. It was a Gatorade experiment. And at first she was, you know, dragging herself to the store to get whatever she needed. And then at the end, genuinely, she was like, I really enjoyed that experiment, you know, like, so just seeing the in-person, the transformation from uh, I have to do this to wow, that was really fun. It's really cool and super testament to what you guys are doing. So that's thanks a feedback. lot, Janaya. <laughs> that's really nice feedback. Thank you very much. And thanks Thank very you. much for your help mm -hmm. in publishing yes. our, our protocols. Thank you very much, Janaya. Yeah. So yeah, anyone else share feedback or questions, you can go ahead. I have a question uh, for the Eau Claire group. Um, I'm interested in trying it next year, and um, I wanted to know that when, when the students use Eau Claire, um, is there some sort of rubric already there to, to help them, or, um, um, or is it scaffolded in such a way that a rubric is not necessary? 
Um, well, yeah, I, I think it's scaffolded in such a way that you don't have to have it. It's, it's an optional feature. You can make rubrics so the students can see how they are evaluated, but you can also do it in another form too, you know. We, we did it mostly in the collaborative evaluation sense. So we had an English teacher log in and I logged in and we marked the, the document and basically then we put up our results. So uh, we were using it more for a situated learning context, but you know, because it was in fact part of our grant application, but it can be used or not used. That, that, that's my feeling. I don't know, Murray, what, uh, what's your feeling about it? Well, in my case, um... I didn't incorporate the evaluation criteria or the tab that maybe you saw on Petra's thing. Um, and because you can put a rubric in there um, where, but it's not, it's um, where students could see how they're graded and, and you can make comments. For me personally, um, because I went through Moodle, uh, I used um, a Moodle rubric. I created a, a, a rubric in Moodle. It was, for me, it was just easier and faster to do it that way. And also I enabled the students to see the rubric, to see how they were going to be graded. So for me, I did it that way. Um, but like Petra said, um, you could certainly scaffold, uh, like, you know, just request fewer things at the beginning and different things in the middle and more complex things at the end um you know in order to get it you know working the way you you want it to work and, sorry go ahead petra but what we have noticed is that you know in one semester is too short of a period to have a student start with okay only being able to write a conclusion to writing a full report it was it was quite demanding and we're asking a lot and so i think that that should be spanned over maybe at least two or even three semesters um, I found that that was a bit easier. It was a bit more of a bite-sized morsel that the, the students could handle with all the other work in the pandemic and also their classes. Perhaps easier for you. you I think you, you teach the same cohort for multiple uh, semesters, right, in Gaspé? Yes, exactly, yes. Uh, um, okay. Um, and then um, can students copy a, a previous lab report template for the, the next one? Like, is, is, can they use old reports and modify that to make a new report? Or... No, it's only the teachers that are able to program reports. Okay. And okay. so you can copy if you want to, and okay. you use, you know, another report and sort of then just change the items and change the names and change the tabs that you're wishing to use uh, and to include in the report. You can do that. We can, we can also give you something that we've already done, you know, we can share. So if you want to do an experiment like that, either Mike or has done, that Mike has done in physics, maybe he can share it with you. We're, we're open to that for sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Jean-Francois, you have your hand up. Yes. Uh, first question would be for Simon and Caroline. Um, well, actually, two questions. First, were the presentations done individually or done in group? And also, uh, in a nutshell, I, I think I missed the point of your research. I didn't mean this in a, in a wrong way. But why did you do this? And what do you hope to get out of it? For the first uh, question, um, it was uh, all the presentations that we observed were in groups of two, three, or four because it was from different teachers and they had different requirements for their, their class. Um, and as for the purpose of the study, maybe I can start, but really it was an idea that came from Simo. So I will just, maybe from my part, why did we do that? Um, we, we observed that the students don't have the opportunity of practicing uh, oral skills during their uh, CIGEP studies, but we did not expect how, how little uh, oral presentation skills or uh, situations where they had to present in front of, a, of the classroom, they actually had. And we found that in, during the interviews, some CIGEPs, and we only conducted that study with francophone CIGEPs, it might be different uh, at Dawson or anything, but uh, some students in some CIGEPs told us they never did an oral presentation during their four semesters in science. 
not even in, in the French or the English as a second language course. So that was for the first part, we wanted to see if it was possible to maybe raise the conscience of the teachers to prepare better the students for that skill. Because even if not all students go on in the university to do science, you know, pure science studies, most of them, actually, they all go to university and even any program, even in the other disciplines, they will have to present in front of an audience at some point because they will be a higher education students. So that's for, for my part, that was the the impulse of doing that research. But I know that Simon has a, a real profoundly personal conviction about that. Well, if I'm lagging, just to tell me. Uh, well, my my conviction was that uh, we were doing extracurricular um, work with the students going to elementary uh, classroom, and we found that they they, they found really a, a big meaning in the their study uh, in natural sciences to be able to apply that to elementary classroom and to give sense to their work. And we found out that they, they, they were gaining confidence about what they were doing. And we were asking ourselves, is what, does in, what are the implications of this extra, extracurricular work? So that was the, the, the starting point. And we were saying to ourselves, maybe that's a good thing for that program. But there, in, in, in Sejet, there are many, many programs that can raise that, that, uh, that self-confident aspect. So we've done interviews and seen at some point that uh, in their... Uh, well, student path that there are some key moments that we can see, seeing uh, you know improvisation or any, doing an animation of a gala or in the scout or name it. So there, there's key moments that they are telling us positive or negative moments that we can see the the evolution of uh, self-efficacy and attitude towards oral communication. And as Caroline said, well, it, it's good to know extracurricularly, but in CEGEP, in our normal courses, are they doing it? And the result is that they're not doing it. None of the students told, told us that in mathematics and in physics, one course, uh, but in general, no oral presentation in mathematics and physics. And I'm a physics teacher, so I can say it uh, loudly, we're not doing it. So th that's a big, something's missing in our formation, uh, in our training uh, in natural sciences program. And also, in general formation, there's some lack that we've seen over the, the interviews and what they were saying to us. It was less formal, but there, there's something to, to think about there. And the first step is to know what are their attitude and, and to know that they're not doing it. So now, can we do it and how can we do it? So that, that was some of the purpose of the study. So in some sense, that's the first step towards something else. Okay, great, super interesting. May I just elaborate on the question that Benedict asked about uh, um, a French version? Uh, yeah, so the French version is where we're awaiting financing. Uh, we weren't refunded by Entente Canada Quebec. So we're scrambling around trying to find money here and there and everywhere. Um, you can use it if you wish. Everything is in English, but you can use it in, a, in the French as well. I know one teacher at, in physics at Gaspé here, Manuel Barrette, he's using it or he's developing a, an experiment to use with it next fall. And he'll just use it with his French students, even though that it's English. Yeah. If you have any ideas as to how we can get it financed, <laughs> we'd be open to that too. <laughs> Thank you, Petra. Uh, Carmen, you have your hand up. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I actually want to go back to Carolyn and Simon. Um, I also find it really interesting. Uh, and um, that is, I hadn't really thought about it. It's true. I can, in the chemistry department at Dawson, we also do not ask any of our students to give a, an oral presentation at all. And to think that when they come out of high school, they, they've had a lot of practice giving presentations in high school and then to all of a sudden stop um, their growth um, is, uh, yeah, quite, um, you know, that's something really to think about and consider. Uh, I was just wondering, because you guys were saying that at the end, um, that it would help to uh, improve their showmanship. So you have ideas of how we can go about helping them to achieve that? 
I think it, some students don't even know that it's something that has to be considered. They don't even know that, for example, particularly in science, they feel that they don't need to be really interesting. That's not, you know, that's not science. I just, I just talk about, you know, that bacteria or something, but it doesn't need to be interesting. So, uh, but for the, the part that you said before that you, you don't have students do oral presentation in chemistry, we, we don't e either, except from that last science course with the, the project and everything, but that's not the only thing that students can do to practice oral skills in CEGEP. They can have other type of activities where they discuss science, but in a formal setting, not maybe necessarily in front of the whole class. The, the main obstacle for that, the doing an oral presentation, everyone has to go in front of the class, it's time. You don't have time to listen to 40 students, for example. But, and Simon did something, and I don't know if you still do that, but discussing lab results between teams, do you all, yeah, do you, yeah, you yeah. still do that? Maybe you can just give a bit of overview. Yeah, well, uh, shortly, uh, uh, well, what I'm doing is that they are doing an open experiment, and they are, they are having different research questions, but there's are, they are grouping in different large research question. So at the end, they are sharing result from in the table behind and the table in front. And they are comparing the result, but comparing the methodology. So they are having feedback from their pair about what is it good or is it not good? So I, I, I've done, I've taken the angle this way. You know, that's, I think it's better to do it this way and to, to take it to, to the level. And after that, I'm passing through each each uh, teams, and I'm taking the best idea of the group, and I'm t telling them, "Could you tell it to the whole class?" So the feedback is coming from the class. So that's really productive. To, for uh, yes, uh, we talk we talk a lot about the you know, written communication, but to do that before the written report, it's really good because er everybody in the class knows what are the the cause of error, knows what's what's the better way or the some of the bad way to do it and they can say well i've done it this way but I, I, another team i've done it this way and i think it's better to do it so in this way so that's the limit of my experiment so the the, the oral part is is in in between as kevin is saying it's it's not too formal but it's it's in between and they are they are really proud to be like i i, I i've done it in a really good way so they, they get confident and they really want to, to to say it to the to the whole class so that that's uh, some interesting point and for uh, to answer your question too uh, i think we have to do training for the showmanship aspect we have to do uh, i've passed uh, my thesis in 180 seconds and i've showed them what is it doing right to be in the in the national fi final so yeah he has to adapt his content he has to be dynamic he has to do a lot of stuff that i'm going through the, the class so uh, you have to ask questions, you have to, to, to go back and forth with the audience, you have to take, to, to, he, the, he's speaking to a general public, so he adapts a lot of his, uh, of his uh, speech, and uh, he's talking to his class, so you in front of your class, what, what should be your, your, your range of knowledge that you want to pass? So uh, to adapt the content and all those things can be taught, but we're not teaching them to do so. So it, it, for me, it's really important to, to go that way. Yeah, I agree. Uh... It just seems like a, a lot to transfer, you know, that a lot of, um, to, a lot, that skill is huge. The showmanship skill is really huge. And, uh, but yeah, I agree. I, I, these, these opportunities, that your suggestions of having these, um, uh, not so formal presentations, but in smaller groups and then to the class, I think is a nice way to, to, to bring that into the, to, to help develop that skill. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, Jean-Francois? Uh, I think you can let Murray maybe go first since he didn't ask a question yet. Okay, sure. Go ahead, Murray. Oh, okay, I just wanted to comment on on that too. We we do. First of all, my students have presentations all the time at Stasia, uh, different courses, not necessarily science, but certainly in almost every other course, they're always um, telling me that they have presentations. Um, so that's not lost. Now in science, it, not as much, but certainly in my class, we do presentations. It's especially true for the science option courses. 
And one of the uh, core competencies are, uh, and part of the exit profile um, that's being addressed through our science option courses is presentations. So people may do it in, in different ways. Um, difficult to assess, I think, for many, many people. So this kind of tool where you have the assessment in the oral communication might be a valuable uh, resource for us. I'm thinking just for, to answer that, I think it could be really interesting comparing um, anglo cegep with franco cegep students, because if you, if they are actually practicing oral communication more in the anglo cegep maybe we just, it was in the uh, notre angle mort. We did not collect data at those CEGEPs. So maybe there's a big cultural difference there. Jean Bonsoir, would you like to? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so for the Eau Claire people, um, I was wondering how is uh, basically. Uh, Eau Claire is a big scaffold essentially to, to create the labs. How is the transfer going for your students, you think, when they get to university or when they basically get in a situation where Eau Claire is not behind this? Um, we, we use Eau Claire, but we don't necessarily use it for all reports, right? There are only a few each semester that we have, well, that I have developed anyway. So they're still getting uh, the traditional report, uh, you having to do the, you know, Word document and plot the graphs in Excel and everything themselves. So they are still getting training in that. And we recognize that they do need it, especially, and I especially do it in my Organic 2 course. Organic 2 exists still here in Gaspé, maybe not for much longer, but I still do it in that course, and uh, which is a, a project-based course for me and has the comprehensive assessment. And so for these projects in this course, they have to do their own reports. In fact, they use Word Online or, or uh, Google, the, the Google platform, so they can work together. Marie, I don't know if you have more to add. No, I think that's about right. I, I think it is um, a scaffolding uh, platform. I mean, teachers, may have other complaints about the about this particular platform especially you know the idea of the the possibility of pre-writing um you know teachers really in a sense collaborating with students to write the report um which may be a bigger issue uh that people need to think about um and actually we try to address it by um making teachers co-authors on any um, any published lab report. So automatically the student name comes and the teacher name comes. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, we'd have to, you'd have to try and figure out, okay, which is this, or or if, if the student would bring this to somebody else and say, look at this great lab report we did, um, you know, well, who did what? You know, which part was written by the teacher, which part was written by the student? Whereas if it's handwritten, mm -hmm. it's, there's no, that question's not there. So you might have to, you might have to play and say, okay, everything um, that a teacher writes is in italic or bold or the opposite, but it becomes a bit more uh, problematic, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, but again, with Petra, you know, um, I try to do some kind of a mix. Uh, of the two kinds of reports. Thank you. So I know we have, well, zero minutes left, <laughs> technically. However, I, Reese, you had put your hand up if you wanted to still ask a question or share something. We have 15 minutes until the next thing. So I, I a little bit of time. ask Karen and Simon. Uh, Karen would know this. Like, Catherine Belek at Gérard Gaudin, doesn't she do a lot of oral presentations in her class? Or her, her research was how she does the rétroaction to her students? I know her for the literacy group and the uh, rétroaction multiple. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the oral thing. 
I, I just I, have, I find it kind of shocking that uh, francophone students will not be doing oral presentations in français, anglais, langue salon, philosophy in those courses. In some sujets, no, never. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um. So, Reese, I know you expressed an interest, and maybe also Benedict. I, we can set up a, a Zoom session if you wish to have a bit more, you know, a bit more of a tour and go more in depth as to how to use Eau Claire and 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 how to work around it. So, just uh, send us an email. Uh, I think our information is on our presentation, but if not, I can also put it in the chat here. I'll put my email. I emailed Murray. I think Benedict did as well. Uh, I would not mind having a, a walkthrough with you guys at one point. Um, and yeah, that would be, that would yeah. be I appreciate that a lot. Maybe we can, I'll we can do it together. Point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My email's in the chat there. pturkovic at sejebjim.ca. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome work awesome. to all groups, honestly. Um, wow. Yes. Thank you, presenters, so much for sharing. And also thank to the you. audience, thank you for being here. Our next uh, presentation is a keynote by Manu Kapoor in 14 minutes. And then afterwards is a award ceremony in Gathertown, for which Carmen is, uh, you know, one of our key people. So please come to support her and to, to, to celebrate with us all. Yeah, Other than right that, instance. enjoy yeah. the rest of the conference. <laughs> Thank Thanks you very much. much. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you, Jana. Great Bye -bye. job. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.